नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत संबुदस् नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत संबुदस् नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत संबुदस् चारो मे भिखवे आहारा भूता सत्ता तिथिया संभवेशीनाग्रहाय कत मे चारो कबलिंकारो आहारो ओलारिको वा सुकुमो वा पशो दुति मनोसंचेतना ततिया विज्ञान चतुंती डिय फ्रेंड्स इन दम एक्चुअली वि डिस्क अबउट न्यूट्रिमेंट्स एक्चुअली ऑन लास्ट संडे और आद लास्ट मंथ ऑलसो इन सिंगल मीडियम but i thought of taking it uh, in english medium as well since it is a very interesting subject and uh, today we hope to discuss the first three nutrients actually different ways buddha explain about his dhamma and trying to deliver us uh, different aspects about the teaching and actually uh, one way of explaining dhamma is with this uh, ahara what we call the nutrients so most of us are familiar with one type of nutriment that is called the edible food so i am currently having this uh, coffee so that also comes under the nutriment edible food so that is quite familiar with you all had our lunch we are uh, in the morning we have breakfast so likewise that is quite common and that is called also one type of ahara and to all these different kinds of nutriments put the maker Uh, common uh, statement that is chattaro me bikkave ahara bhuta rangwa sattana tithya so now we all are already born but still we need ahara we need uh, sort of nutrients because for the sustenance of this body so the body's sustenance is depending on ahara sabbe satta ahara tithika so that is another can you increase the volume a little bit so that is one aspect so even though we are born we can't just live alone we we need continuous support coming from the nutrients so as a result of that we are constantly uh, partaking food so that is necessary so without food we can only survive several days maybe maximum and ultimately we may die dried up without nutrients without nutrition we can say so that is something that we all can understand so edible food is therefore something necessary something required so we have many societies food organizations food festivals <laughs> many things are available in order to uh, get this food <clears throat> and we are earning and uh, living and making different occupations so that we have some food but interesting point is that buddha is trying to give a different perspective to even to this uh, edible food and he give a very strong simile i think this is uh, something that you might have heard so this the simile is very strong uh the simile is going like say there is a couple with a young child so they are going to cross a desert and they only have limited amount of food and they are coming now to the middle of the desert unfortunately now food ran out now what to do now they are discussing among two of them between two of them and no option now there is no food at all and no water maybe little water is available but same amount of travel has to be continue but no food at all so what are they going to do now both husband and wife they decide to kill their child now this is a simile by the way <laughs> so don't worry about it so it's a, this is a simile but very strong simile so those both husband and wife decided to kill their son because I'll kill their son and prepare some meat through that flesh and they are going to eat it just to cross the desert and then buddha asks from monks monks when they are eating their own son's flesh will they get any kind of a greed will they get any kind of a desire that i am going to have that next day as well it's a really delicious do they have that kind of an attitude do they really want to store it so while eating also they are say 
crying, lamenting. Where is my son? Where is our dear son? So they are eating like that. Then monks, of course, answer, Bhante, I mean, that, that is their own son's flesh. So as a result of that, they may not get any greed when they are having that food. And they are taking it only for the sustenance of their body so that they can simply cross the desert. And Buddha mentioned, this is the way that you need to look at edible food. So this is a very interesting simile, sun's flesh. So when we are eating day to day, are we having that kind of an attitude? So sometimes we eat for fun, sometimes we eat for kind of a, say, kind of a sport, maybe to beautify our body, to strengthen our body so that we can go for the next World Cup. <laughs> so likewise, so we have different uh, reasons to have food and we sometimes forget about uh, the reason, exact reason, the proper reason why we are taking food. So Buddha mentioned if one have proper understanding about this edible food, he may understand the five chords of sensual desires. You know, through eyes we are trying to satisfy by, sat I mean, uh, by seeing various sights and through ears we are trying to hear various songs and melodies and all sorts of things and through the nose also we are trying to go through a lot of odors, flavors, sorry, uh, smells and through the tongue we are going to en enjoy various flavors, tastes and through the body we are trying to enjoy some sort of uh, tangible sensations. So this is these are the something that we call as panchakama guna or five chords of sensual pleasures. And very much like this is for what people are living. I mean, even though we are categorizing at uh, first world, second world, third world, like that. But anyway, ultimately, if we consider, so this is, these are the things that we are going after. Sometimes we call it as pleasure principle. So either to look at something beautiful, either to hear something beautiful or to smell something beautiful pleasant and to taste something delicious and to have something uh, good sensations. So these are the gross kind of uh, five sensual chords and therefore Buddha mentioned so if one have proper understanding of the edible food he may ultimately will understand about these five sensual chords. What would, what would be the result? Will you be have a kind of a strong desire to have them further? Or you may have a kind of a dispassionate attitude towards them. So ultimately, once we have a proper understanding, proper attitude, and we know exact reason why we are parting in food, then Buddha mentioned one can even attain anagami, non-return. He can become a non-returner by fully understanding this gross edible food. So you can say <coughs> edible food is also a kind of a deep subject in that sense, even though we don't uh, consider that level. So it, it is a deep subject. So if we properly understand the purpose of having edible food and uh, how this uh, different food going to entertain us, for what exact reason I am taking it, what are the other uh, consequences if I not properly manage it, if I am not moderate in eating. So likewise we can have kind of a broader understanding about edible food. So that is why Buddha mentioned, if you have a proper understanding of edible food, you can have more understanding, more in deep understanding. As a result of that you can completely cut off that uh, sensual desire. That is why one can even become a non-returner, anagami. Now, that is why probably you are familiar with that suppose that you are going to uh, take precepts, say on the observance day. So you are, while you are taking your food, you go for food reflection. Probably you have heard food reflections. I am taking this food for, not for fun, not for sport, just to uh, maintain this body, just to continue this uh, spiritual endeavor. Uh, say without the food I might this body can't sustain and just to 
remove hunger, thirst. So I am just taking this food. So likewise, a wise reflection is there. And for monks, it is compulsory to do such kind of a wise reflection so that we are not having any kind of a conceit or greed or that kind of different uh, other defilements with respect to food. So if one has that sort of attitude towards the edible food, then we can say, okay, you are wisely taking your food. Now, that subject actually we, we can say it's uh, not difficult to understand. Say edible food is something that we all are familiar with and uh, there could be difficulties uh, or consequences if we are not moderate in eating and uh, again various other things like different defilements if we are not properly contemplate. So with the teachings then we can manage that and even we can uh, use this uh, ahara, edible food to our own understanding. But the other three types are more interesting more subtle and those are the ones actually we don't know even that we are partaking. Edible food we know, okay, in the morning I had my breakfast. During the lunch time, okay, I had my lunch. And maybe on the other days, okay, you all are having your dinner. So and time to time maybe short eats. So you these are quite familiar with. But the other three types, other three edible, other three nutriments are not familiar with. So therefore, Buddha's subject on ahara is something deep. And uh, one important another aspect is, if you have proper understanding about these four nutriments, Venerable Sariputta mentioned in the Samaditti Sutta, one may have the proper view, correct view. So, different levels of correct view we can discuss and one level of correct view is to have proper understanding about these four types of nutrients and therefore proper understanding of nutrients can even lead to the noble eightfold path you can see kind of a, a broader spectrum is available so one has to have proper understanding about the nutrients the causes of their understanding, causes of their those nutrients, and how to how the cessation of these nutrients would happen, and is there a path leading to cease these nutrients? You can see the four noble truths can be uh, redefined with respect to nutrients. So it's a kind of a deep subject. So if one have proper understanding, therefore, about nutrients and the reason, the cause of those. And again, the cessation of those, and again, the path leading to the cessation of those nutrients, then uh, proper understanding, proper view, correct view, right view, samaditti is available. And you can see the, say, the benefits. Sabbaso raga anusayanam pahaya. So, all the different kinds of latent tendencies of lust may be gone. Patigahanusayanam patimino detta. Say all different kinds of ill will, tendencies, you can eradicate. Asmiti ditti mananusayanam samuhanitva. So all different wrong views, self view, personality view, sakkaya ditti, all can be eradicated, uprooted. Avijjam pahaya vijjam upadetta. You can abandon all ignorance and you can arouse, generate wisdom. In this very life, one can attain arahanthut. So you can see how deep the subject is. So if you have proper understanding about these nutrients, so it is not an easy, easy task or easy thing, but it's a really broader subject. Now we discuss a little bit about, uh, say, edible food as the first nutriment. And to have some understanding about all four categories of nutrients and their benefits. So what are the other three? The second one is called Passa. Passo Dutiyo, contact. Now why Buddha mentioned contact as a nutriment? Now probably you have heard, say, actually this is something I heard from outside, that if somebody, a little kid or even a, a puppy, if he is not 
exposed to uh, light, then his eyes may not grow, his vision may not grow. Assume that you are keeping a puppy or a kitten uh, for a long time on a dark cage, then his eyesight may not properly happen. That means for eyesight to properly grow, to happen, you need to expose him, it, to the light, to the other external phenomena, external visions. That means we need to have this uh, eye contact. So that's why, I mean, we say, okay, these puppies are not yet open their eyes. So we call like that. So once they open their eyes, they start reacting, okay, they are recognizing so this and that. And when our children are opening their eyes, okay, we are trying to teach them, okay, this is this, this is that, this is this color, this is this color, this is your dad, this is your mom. <laughs> so likewise, so when eyes are open, so through the eyes, so we are trying to get a lot of information. Can you keep your eyes closed for a long time? So maybe, very hard, at least one hour you can keep <laughs> when you are sitting in meditation. But you don't like to keep your eyes closed, then you may complain. Say, I can remember that uh, during some time back, the government has forbidden, uh, I think, Facebook or WhatsApp or something. So people start complaining. So this is a human right to have Facebook, to have WhatsApp. <laughs> so whatever it is. So people want this. They want to see. They want to enjoy through their eyes. So without uh, that enjoyment, now it's very much like difficult to survive. Suppose uh, government say, okay, for one month, no TV, no channels. For one month, no uh, social media. That's the correct term. So what do you think? Now we are very used to that. I mean, we consider it as a very important thing and it's a must to have. And we can't survive without it. And like that, uh, we have become kind of a slave to those things. You can imagine how people would have faced their life or lived their lives a long time ago. They didn't have internet, they didn't have WhatsApp, <laughs> they didn't have Facebook, they didn't have any kind of uh, cinema. You can imagine. Probably they might have gone to a cliff, or, I mean, to a cliff and they probably look at the environment, have a nice... Uh, scenery, maybe. In a way, very, you know, aesthetic, innocent, kind of uh, entertainment. But now we are in the kind of a more gross level of entertainment through our eyes. And again, we consider it as a kind of a necessity, as a must. Now through the eyes, as much as possible, they are for we want to see things. How about ears? Same thing, like, okay, I mean, you want to hear many things. Is it all Dhamma that you want to hear? <laughs> Very unlikely, right? So people want to hear music, they want to participate in musical shows. And now I heard that they are opening the Lotus Tower. Now that's the today's uh, adventure. So you are going there to look at things and enjoy. So we want to enjoy through our eyes, through our ears. And maybe through our nose, same thing, we want to enjoy. And through our tongue, similarly, we want to get different tastes time to time. Nowadays it's a bit difficult because of economic problems, but otherwise... Okay, at least once a while you can go to a hotel and get some delicious food. So likewise, we want to entertain. Now, is it the only side? So is it through our eyes we can enjoy only the happy, pleasurable things? So sometimes we have to go for the opposite. Sometimes we have to go through some difficult situations. We have to see uh, undesirable pictures, undesirable visions. Say someone's death, our loved one deaths, maybe some tragic tragic situations, maybe an accident. So those sides are also there. I mean, even though we have the ability to see, it doesn't mean that we can only see the beauty, the uh, auspicious side, 
but we have to see even the uh, undesirable sides as well unavoidable <coughs> similarly say when you are hearing say you are getting on to the private bus and the conductor may switch on the radio or the music probably you may love it or you may even hate it but can't help now you have paid the bill <laughs> paid taken the ticket you can't now get it get down you have to hear what they are playing it's kind of a torturing say sometimes you are going through a particular place and there may be a bad smell you have to bear it say you are going through some difficult situation due to a illness and ayurvedic doctor may give a detox decoction then you have to take it even though it is quite bitter <laughs> and sometimes your husband wife may prepare some food can't eat <laughs> but can't help you have to take it just to survive and likewise and sometimes we you uh, go through a lot of suffering maybe uh, punishments uh, have to go through some painful situations and bodily pains are there aches are there and you have to go through it so what do you think and the, how about the mind so are they all the beautiful wholesome thoughts come into the mind so that you thinking of them and you enjoy them or sometimes some worries regrets all are coming to the mind and again you are going through some suffering now there are these six senses in that sense <clears throat> so when we are using these six senses eyes ears nose tongue body and the mind so we have very much like trapped in them but we never take it in that angle we usually think okay i have a good eyesight so it is a kind of a gift i have to enjoy that as much as possible i have a good uh, hearing so i have to enjoy it why not so tongue nose body are very similar so this is the approach that we have but buddha give a different perspective here and he give a very interesting simile again he say okay there is a cow it's a flayed cow the skin was removed but not died still now this flayed cow is now going closer to a wall remember a flayed cow no skin so what happen when assume that uh, it, it want to get some safety by leaning to a wall what happen so there are various insects in that wall so they all come and get on to the body of the cow and now they have a kind of a feast because you know there is no any kind of wrapper available so the skin is a kind of a wrapper so we can say there is a wound and around that wound we have a kind of a wrapper now the wrapper is removed <laughs> i can see that some of your faces are little changing <laughs> so you can see so even this particular cow go to closer to a wall so there is no excuse so it has to go through all these difficulties coming through various insects now suppose it is going quickly running to a water getting jump into a reservoir or jump into a river what happen next still various insects are there okay tortoise maybe uh, fish many many things so they start eating this particular cow now suppose he quickly get 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 out of it and go to a playground kind of an open space now what happen so different uh, crows and you know birds are going flies are going and they all land on top of this uh, cow and they start eating now likewise buddha mentioned to look at this pass aahara the nutriment contact now even though we consider having this healthy eyes ears nose tongue body and mind as a gift we have to look at the other side as well so having these have a kind of a torturing as well so the opposite side 
that we don't like to enjoy, we don't want to experience, without any control, we have to go through it. That's why I mentioned, it is not always the pleasurable things that we have to look at. We have to look at something that we don't want to look at. We have to see something that, we have to hear something that we don't want to really hear. And we may have to go through a lot of uh, smells that we don't really enjoy, but kind of uh, difficult ones. And again, the taste, tangibles, and various thoughts are similar. So therefore, under having some sort of an understanding about these uh, six kinds of uh, s- contact help us to have kind of a dispassion, having some dif- deep understanding about our this living, this so-called living. We consider, I mean, okay, I am born to this world, I am enjoying senses, I have some healthy senses. So this is the way that we look at but say you are getting old now, you are sort of facing with a lot of trouble, you are going through some sickness, then you may open your eyes and see, oh, yes, it's not, why not? It is true. So therefore, Buddha mentioned, if one properly understands nutriment contact, they may understand the f- three kinds of feelings. So when you have different uh, Contact, it conditions feelings. Probably you can remember when Buddha mentioned Pasapacha Vedana. This is a familiar term. Say, contact conditions feelings. So, whenever there are uh, a kind of contact conduce you to generate pleasurable feelings, okay, you may enjoy pleasurable feelings. When there are contacts happen which is producing uh, painful feelings, okay, you have to go through painful feelings. When there are certain kind of uh, contact which is con- contributing towards the generating of, uh, say, neutral feelings, okay, then neutral feelings are happening. Now, therefore, you may have deeper understanding about feelings if you have some understanding about contact. So, they are interdependent. Contact conditions feelings. So, in a way, we can con- connect it to Vedana Nupasana. So, in a way, if you are able to look at different kinds of feelings, probably you can understand this contact as well. So, when assume that you are looking at something and you get a pleasurable feeling. So, you can, ima- you can immediately see how this pleasurable feeling has happened. Prob- probably because of that contact. That's a beautiful sight and you are looking at it. So, that beautiful sight, when it is getting in contact with the eye, then the pleasurable feeling is going to arise. Say there is a pleasure arising in, within yourself when you are hearing a particular song. So then you can look at, rather than really enjoying and being delighted with it, if you look back how it has happened, probably you can recognize, okay, there is a contact happen at the ear, so that has produced this pleasurable feeling. So likewise, it's a kind of a mindfulness practice, mindful listening, mindful seeing. So likewise, it's a kind of a meditation we come across in uh, Dhamma Nupassana called Ayatana Bhavana. So you are keeping in guard of all these uh, six senses and how each and every sense come into the operation and accordingly a different kind of feeling going to produce. So you are keep an eye, you are vigilant about what's going on when it, when something happens at your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind and you are recognizing what kind of feeling is arising. So when you know, okay, there is a particular feeling arising, it is disappearing, there is a contact happens, it is disappearing, a particular sense now in operation, now it has ceased. Now this produces a lot of very strong practice for our prasana. Disva ayatunupadam samma chittam vimuchati. On certain other places, Buddha mentioned, so if you know exactly how these different senses are arising, how different contact arising, how different, uh, say, feelings are arising and they pass away, so that helps to even liberate the mind. So therefore, Buddha mentioned, if you fully understand this nutriment contact, 
one can even become an arahant so these are not therefore easy subjects i mean these are not kind of narrow subjects so this have to be taken into practice so if you are carefully recognizing each and every sense faculty how the contact happen how contact conditions different kinds of feelings and what may happen to those feelings and what may happen to those contact to those sense faculties so that produce lot of uh, wisdom insights and that may help to uproot all the defilements and one can even become an arahant now the third one third one is called uh, mano sanchetana ahara now we are actually going little bit more and more subtle levels so we all can understand the edible food that is quite common easy to understand for that also we may have pr- kind of agreed and that we can understand so when we are next time having our food probably we can reflect a little bit without quickly jumping and eating so you can remember how mindful eating can do so we have a mindful eating video produced by satipasala you can probably look at it <laughs> so how you can eat mindfully so actually first of all we need to develop that mindfulness at least i know what i am eating now so rather than going in front of a tv and take your meals while going through the cricket match you better eat mindfully so that is that is necessary so nowadays people don't have even time to eat mindfully they may be eating while traveling they may be eating while reading they may be eating while having a discussion maybe looking at a television so we don't have even time to eat quite unfortunate anyway so if you are developing this mindful eating then you may even recognize how these uh, different desires are arising in the mind and maybe little conceit arising in the mind greed arising in the mind now you may address them mindfully and without having those defilements you are having your meal so good so those may produce more understanding about the sense faculties sense desires and that can be slowly abandoned and you can eat without having any defilement now now all these different uh, nutrients actually have tanha craving as their cause now we are eating because our body needs to be sustained kind of a desire desire to live bhava tanha and uh, as we just discussed when we are looking at things so we are we want to enjoy through our eyes kind of a tanha hearing music just to enjoy entertain kind of sensual desire kama tanha so if we analyze further you can say okay in general all different uh, kinds of nutrients are conditioned by this craving tanha another way of looking at it is therefore buddha mention is that uh, in dvaita anupassana sutta yankinchi dukkham sambhoti sabbang aahara pachya so whatever the suffering happens that happens because of these nutrients ahaaran teva asesa viraga nirodho nati dukkhasa sambhav in case if you are you able to fully understand these four types of uh, nutrients as a result of that you can abandon all not grasping any of them then there is no suffering etamadinava nyatva dukkham ahara pachaya sambhaharam parinyaya sambhaharam anisito so one can have a kind of a situation you may be having your food but there is no attachment you are able to maintain your mind free from any attachment to food so there's a interesting investigation done by a person called uh, subha so his assignment given by his teacher is to investigate the buddha <laughs> so you can see even those time there are different assignments research going on so that his assignment is to find a fault and recognize how buddha 
maintain his day-to-day -day activities. So this young man uh, following Buddha to each and every place, thinking that he, he is not noticed. <laughs> so he is continuing for many months going after Buddha. And how Buddha eat, how Buddha wear robes, how he preach, and how he discuss with others. So everything, everything he learn. And ultimately submit a thesis. <laughs> So, in his thesis, he made a very interesting uh, finding. Uh, while Buddha eats, so his, his finding is, while Buddha eats, so Buddha recognized various tastes, but there is no any greed towards any particular taste. So this is a finding that uh, Subha is including to his uh, findings. Rasa Patisangvedi Chako Bhagava nocha rasa raga patisangvedi. So Buddha recognized each and every flavor, each and every taste. But with respect to any of those flavors, there is no greed, any say desire arising in Buddha's mind. So this is a finding that, research finding. He has put it to his thesis. So you can see, I mean, how it has happened. Now suppose... Uh, you didn't uh, enjoy food for a long time and all of a sudden your friend is coming with a very good food. Now can you have simply uh, food without entertaining it, without having any greed, any desire? <laughs> very difficult, isn't it? So anyway, now there is a possibility that uh, if one is developing step, step by step, so one can even eat food but there is no desire. Or simply tastes and all these things are there, but there is no desire. Now suppose you are looking at various things, maybe a beautiful sight. Assume that there is no desire. Say a beautiful sight, quite enjoyable, but your mind remains calm. It is capable, you are capable of keeping your mind kind of a, a stillness, equanimous, without having any desires. Say you even listen beautiful music, but your mind is not involved. You are able to maintain peacefulness in your mind. Say you are going through some uh, good fragrances, still you are capable of maintaining your mind unattached. So as we just discussed, you are going through some, say, delicious food, like Buddha did, but without any desires. You may go through all the different flavors, you may recognize them, but no desires. And maybe you are going through some good ten, tac, I mean, tactile sensations, but no desires. Now these are very interesting areas that we can think of. How one can achieve that? It is not that Buddha trying to avoid all these different contact. So he, he is not advising us to keep our eyes closed. He is not advising us to say, avoid any kind of uh, sounds, smells, tastes. We may have to go through all them. But how about maintaining a mind free from attachment? So these are the areas actually that Buddha is pointing out. It is not that completely we are trying to abandon all these uh, uh, external uh, objects, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, uh, tangibles. Rather, while we are going through them, how to maintain a peaceful mind? How to maintain an uninvolved mind? Assume that you were able to maintain a calm, peaceful, uninvolved, unstressed kind of a mind. Now you are, due to some reason, you, are, you have to go through some uh, difficult situation. Someone is blaming. Are you able to maintain your calmness? Say you, are, you have to go through some difficult situation and someone uh, lovable has met with an accident, kind of a tragic situation, can you maintain your calmness? So likewise we can think both sides, either to the positive side or to the negative side. When you are going through those extremes, how about maintaining your mind unattached, not bothered, not hindered? Now, when it comes to the third one, that is even subtle. The third one is called Mano Sanchetana Ahara, the nutriment volition. 
Now, when we consider volition, say we know that uh, different kinds of actions are there. Okay, bodily actions are there. Verbal actions are there. Mental actions are also there. Say bodily actions. If you consider the unwholesome bodily actions, we all are familiar with, okay, killing an animal, killing a whatever person. So those are unwholesome actions that we can conduct through the body. Then, uh, maybe stealing, sexual misconduct. Now these are all unwholesome activities one can do with the body. If we consider the unwholesome activities that one can do with the speech, okay, lying, uh, divisive speech, uh, flattering. So those kind of uh, unwholesome speech is also there. And uh, we can have some strong desire in the mind, strong anger, hate in the mind. So that becomes quite unwholesome mental activity. Abhijja domanas. So likewise, we can recognize certain unwholesome actions are available. Either bodily actions, verbal actions and mental actions. Now, what would be the consequence when we are having them, when we are conducting them? What do you think? Kamma is generated. So, yeah. so I mean, probably you can do them, but you, but you need to pay for them. <laughs> the vipaka is coming. Kamma is generated. How about the wholesome side? Okay, you are doing some good activities. You are uh, helping another person, uh, releasing an uh, animal from its death. So likewise, some compassionate activities, bodily activities. Maybe protecting someone's wealth. So likewise, some good bodily activities are there, wholesome activities are there. Also, you generate karma. Say, some wholesome verbal activities. Okay, you are preaching Dhamma, you are helping others to generate unity among them, you are always trying to uh, tell the truth. So likewise, you can use your speech only for the better purpose. Then again, you are generating good karma. And through the mind also, say you are practicing uh, loving kindness, compassion. So likewise, through the mind also, you can generate good karma. And accordingly, we can have more wholesome uh, karma generated. Now, how about maintaining a mind free from any bodily activities, any verbal activities, any mental activities? So what I want to tell is, now say, someone will ask you to stay quiet. Don't talk. And keep your body also still. Don't move. <laughs> Can you do that? So you are trying to do that, right? I mean, we are trying to do that through meditation. So we always want to do something. Don't you? <laughs> so if you are not doing something, someone else will come and tell, why don't you do something? <laughs> Say, so people can motivate us, right? So assume that someone is uh, uh, not helping another person. Another one is coming and telling, oh, why don't you help him? You should have help him. On the other side, say, you, someone is blaming and you are not uh, taking any revenge. Another one may propose, you should have told him no. So we, someone can motivate us to do something, to tell something. Now these actions, are they really our own, happen, are they really happening because of our own initiative? Or can someone influence us? So both can happen, right? Okay, the actions can happen because of our own initiative. So I have my own volition, I have my own initiative, own requirement, then I am doing it. Probably I can do something because my parents are telling me to do it. My husband is telling ask me need to do it. My wife is asking me need to do it. Okay, the government is telling me to do it. So that's why you are using the QR code, right? It is not that you want it, no? <laughs> so someone else can uh, persuade you. So, so all these bodily activities, therefore, either can happen through our own initiative because of our own volition 
or someone else's influence. And uh, some subtle aspects are also there. Now say you are going to a supermarket and you are selecting a particular brand. What is your, I mean, the more favorable brand? <laughs> Maybe in the food, rice, earlier? I don't know. <laughs> so, so why are you going to a supermarket and buying a particular brand? So that's a, say, activity, no, an action, bodily action. So, is it because you want it? You really like it? Is it because that you know that it's really nutritious? That's the best product? Probably if you have done a good research and you found out everything, okay, this is the best product, okay, now you are going it. Isn't it because of an advertisement that you have seen for a long time? <laughs> Can't it be? So that is also possible, right? So unknowingly, our mind being conditioned. Say you are going through some, uh, say, uh, again and again looking at your TV and again and again uh, a marketing is going on, advertisement is shown. So slowly your mind being conditioned. So next time we, you go to the supermarket and you automatically, automatically your hand may go to that particular product. Why? Because your mind is, mind is preconditioned because of that advertisement. Now likewise this conditioning process happening in our mind is very subtle. So therefore, this volition happened in our mind, we can't say it is because of our own initiative, it is because of some pure initiative, but it may have a lot of influences coming due to various causes. Say how we uh, educated ourselves, whom that we have associated, what is the culture that we have brought up with. So what are our previous, say, childhood experiences? What are our likes and dislikes? What are we trying to tell us? So many, many reasons are there to, say, manipulate our volition. So therefore, we can't say, even though I am doing an action, it is because of my own volition, but that volition is fairly conditioned. But who has to pay for that? Is the person who prepared the advertisement going to pay for that? No, I mean, we have to pay for that. We may be doing bodily activity, we may be doing, telling something, verbal activity, we may be thinking, and we have to pay for that. We are accumulating a lot of karma, we have to be responsible. But we are doing it due to various causes, due to various reasons, various influences, but we are the one going to pay for that. So mental volition is therefore very subtle but very dangerous. <laughs> so you are taking action, bodily action, verbal action, mental action, but generate a lot of karma and not only within this life, till we attain Nibbana, we have to pay for that. Now, Buddha therefore give a very strong simile here also for the mental volition. And he say, there is a, a pit, very tall pit, very deep pit. It is filled with burning ember, burning coal, we say. A wise person is there, he knows that there is burning ember available there. So, if he jump to it, what happened? <laughs> it, I mean, that's the end of him, right? I mean, he may go through a lot of suffering, he may burn, and ultimately he may die. So therefore, his, his all actions are going away from that burning ember, the pit of uh, ember. And Buddha mentioned that there is no smell coming from that, no, uh, you know, the flames coming out of it, no smoke coming out of it. So it is not noticeable, but this wise person is no wise person aware that there is uh, this particular pit, it has burning ember, I should avoid it. But unfortunately, some two strong men come and capture this fellow and now they are pulling this person towards the, this burning pit. Now what is the idea in his mind? So he is always trying hard to get away from it, right? So he, he, he wish, may I be free from these people? I want to get out of this problem. 
I should avoid this pit. So Buddha therefore mentioned this is the way you have to look at the mental volition. The nutriment mental volition has to look at in this angle. So that means we have to minimize in a way our volitional activities. We have to minimize our volitional verbal activities. We have to minimize our mental volitional activities. Even though someone may persuade us, even though our own urgency initiative may come, requirements are there, how to minimize these uh, volitional activities? It's very difficult. <coughs> That's why, I mean, we are suffering with uh, what you call uh, doing syndrome. We always want to do something. We can't stop uh, just being quiet. I want to tell something, I want to do something, I want to think something. So we always want to do. But the opposite is recommended in a way. Now how one can do it? Now I simply give you a simple example. Say you are sitting in uh, meditation. How many bodily activities are there? How many volitional activities you are doing in uh, Anapanasati? Are you looking at something through your eyes? No, right? You have to keep your eyes closed. Assume that you are in a quiet place. So your ears are also not operating. We can say like that, okay? And how about nose? Okay, that's a simple, uh, pl I mean, the neutral orders are there. So it is also not agitated. So your mouth closed. So no taste. That's also fairly calmed down. And are you breathing forcefully? Oh, you allow simply body to breathe naturally. Is the, is the breathing a volitional activity or not? What do you think? Is it a volitional activity? It's called involuntary activity, right? So you don't need volition to breathe. So the body may take care of breathing. So even though we consider breathing, this mindfulness of breathing as a simple practice, it has a fair depth. So you have fairly calmed down bodily activities. You have to sit comfortably. You have to sit carefully without changing your posture, for example, for some time at least. So your bodily activities are fairly minimized. How many bodily activities are there? So no volitional activities, by the way. But other bodily activities, involuntary activities may be continuing, but volitional bodily activities are fairly minimized. How about verbal activities? Are you talking? No, right? I mean, you have to be quiet. So the volitional activities are also fairly minimized. I mean, the volitional verbal activities are also fairly minimized. Now we can actually come to another level. Okay, the gross level of bodily activities are like stealing, sexual misconduct, killing and all sorts of things. And say in the wholesome side, okay, you are helping and doing some bodily activities. And the subtle level is what we call the in-breath and out-breath. So if you consider the gross level of bodily activities are there, for all these gross level of bodily activities underneath, we have the very subtle breathing as the most subtlest bodily activity. Now, we are referring that activity during our mindfulness of breathing. And that volitional activity, we can't say volitional, we can say the bodily activity, also now calms down. So when you are paying attention to breathing, so breath becomes subtler and subtler. So that's also reducing, right? So there are no gross bodily activities, there are no intentional bodily activities and whatever the available uh, bodily activity, what we call the Kaya Sankara, is also calming down. Now, if we consider the volitional verbal activities, those are fairly cut off. We are not talking, not lying, but we keep ourselves very quiet 
but assume that your mind is talking in a chatter is going on now when you are paying close attention to breathing what happened to that inner chatter so you know what is inner chatter right so there is like a complete chattering going on in the mind so that what happened to that during mindfulness on breathing so that also may calm down each and every time you have to pay attention to breath again in breath again out breath again in breath again out breath so you have no time to talk you have no time to think about various subjects so less and less conceptual proliferation now now you are your mind is also calming down thinking lessens so basically what has happened now so all volitional activities are fairly calmed down and there is a situation probably you might understand these volitional activities are really kind of a burden how about avoiding any volitional activity so this is very interestingly mentioned in the pottapada sutta so there when one reaches a fairly high level of concentration he come to a determination all these volitional activities are kind of a burden so let me stop volitional activities what would be the result <laughs> and buddha mention one may touch the cessation nirodham pusati one may touch the cessation so the bodily activities are calm down you are not volitionally doing anything bodily verbal activities are calm down you can even calm down with akka vichara applied thought and sustained thought that is the subtlest level and now you are not even thinking no thoughts fairly calm mind and you are not now going after another sankhara another volitional activity another chetana you minimize all chetana avoid any kind of volition and then buddha mention your mind may touch the cessation nirodham pusati so it's a kind of a deep subject you can see how beautifully buddha take us to different levels of understanding so rather than now mind want to do something it want to rest A, a yogi who has gone through this kind of a proper process may be vipassana practice so he may understand okay let me quietly sit let me have a rest let me minimize thinking let me enjoy that inner silence let me avoid any kind of volitional activities just be so likewise a complete change may happen if properly one address this uh, what you call the nutriment mental volition therefore buddha mention if one understand properly about this mental volition one may understand three levels of craving different types of craving say kama tanha bhava tanha vibhava tanha why all our actions are happening because of some driving happens through craving say you want to do something why because there is a sensual desire maybe burning within you say you want to enjoy some music why there's a sensual desire kama tanha say you want to uh, enjoy some uh, say food may be a kind of a desire it doesn't matter like i mean say this is the lunch time and you feel hungry okay you are going and having food without desire doesn't matter but typically we are been driven by desires so if one properly understand mental volition then buddha may buddha is telling okay you understand the full subject of these desires different kinds of craving so if one is able to eradicate craving tanha kaya what is that that is nibbana 
So complete removal of craving is Nibbana. That means if one understands mental volition properly, one can attain Arhanship. So that is, that is the depth of this subject. You can recognize, I mean, what a kind of a spectrum that Buddha is touching. He starts with very easy thing that we all familiar with, that is the edible food. Then he expresses about, say, the contact, passer. Each and every sense faculty is there to that, the respective uh, sense objects are there. So he talks about that uh, contact. Now he is taking us more deeper, that is what is called this uh, mental volition as a nutriment. How one can minimize that chetana, minimize that uh, nutriment mental volition. And that helps to even touch the nirodha, cessation, to understand three types of craving, minimize those craving, uproot craving and ultimately attain nibbana. And now we have another subject that is uh, nutriment consciousness that I will discuss tomorrow. And with that I like to conclude uh, today's Dhamma sermon. Thank you very much for attentive listening. So actually I have a small announcement regarding uh, uh, English retreat going to happen in Nisarnavane. So this is conducted by uh, Mrs. Rupika Gunavardhana. Uh, it is in English medium. Starts on uh, 25th this month, September. So there are enough uh, opportunities, I mean space is available. Because typically for singular retreats many participants are available, but for English retreats not many participants. So if you want to have very good uh, seclusion, you can enjoy that in this uh, English retreats. So therefore please uh, pass the message. Uh, Mrs. Rupika particularly asked me to give, I mean, pass this uh, message. So on 25th starts, maybe in the evening, and you can contact Mrs. Rupika Gunavardhana. So I think Dilhara may have her contact number. Emailed. Okay. So please uh, pass the message to every, uh, whoever interested, because now space is available, and it's a five days retreat. And again, uh, so I can uh, spend some time in this sharing of merits. Today lunch dana is by Dr. Randula Samarasinghe and family. May the merits achieved, accrued be helpful for them to have good health and help the children to excel in their education. Okay. So now we actually we have spent some time in uh, discussing them and uh, listening to them and you all have practiced mindfulness uh, and develop some uh, insights, wisdom. So with all these, whatever the merits that we have accumulated, we share these merits with all the past relatives, we share these merits with all the celestial beings and we share these merits with all the beings who are in need of merits and we wish these merits Help us also to attain path, fruition, nibbana. While keeping these good wishes in our mind, let's recite the traditional verses. Ettavata cha amhehi sambhatang punya sampadang sabbe deva anumodantu sabbha sampatti siddhya Ettavata cha amhehi sambhatang punya sampadang sabbe bhuta anumodantu sabbha sampatti siddhya Etta veta cham he he sambatang punya sampadang Sabbe satta anumodantu sabba sampati siddhya Aka satta chabumata deva naga mahidika Punyantang anumoditva chirang rakhantu sasanang Aka satta chabumata deva naga mahidika Punyantang anumoditva chirang rakhantu desanang Aka satta chabumata deva naga mahidika Punyantang anumoditva chirang rakhantu mamparang Idang vo nyati nang ho tu sukita huntu nyatayo Idang vo nyati nang ho tu sukita huntu nyatayo Idang vo nyati nang ho tu sukita huntu nyatayo Imina punya kamme na mame bala samagamo 
satang samagamoho tu yavani bana patiya imina punya kamme na mami bala samagamo satang samagamoho tu yavani bana patiya imina punya kamme na mami bala samagamo satang samagamoho tu yavani bana patiya sadu sadu sadu